for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Great. Exactly okay, a um, minute. <laughs> awesome. A teacher would know, right? Um, yeah. So let me do the questions. There's three. I, I just got another one. Um, standing for Truth from Area 85 Restorations with a $10 super chat. So they really want to know the answer to this. <laughs> I'll make Can it worthy of the ten dollars. Thank That's you. I would appreciate it on their behalf. Um, can the creationism model relating to genetics make future novel predictions? If not, nothing you have said during this debate, the entire debate, means anything because evolution has made these predictions. Oh man, such such a good question. I I could probably mm. go on for three hours about the prediction. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm gonna make it. Oh, there's another. I'm gonna make it there. short. I mean, I okay. think they, I think they can easily tell that based on our model of created heterozygosity, uh, we would predict that the vast majority of our genetics and DNA elements are are functional. I mean, we literally spent an hour discussing that. That is a novel future uh, prediction that are on paper. So I mean, I could um, show those after. Also, uh, we make predictions based on DNA barcoding and orphan genes and taxonomically restricted endogenous retroviruses as a way to determine where that boundary is. People like R and Ra, you know, they'll say, you know, where does the phylogeny break down? Well, guess what? We all predict nests and hierarchical patterns. Therefore, we need to look to genetics and make these predictions. Let's say we say family levels, the kind boundary. So we're going to predict, uh, you know, certain functional roles like in the cytochrome C um, gene, for example, that are specific to these uh, species, to these creatures. Um, that, that's why there's is a, a little known phenomenon called protein moonlighting. You know, these proteins are multifunctional. So that's what we're predicting about the ATP synthase proteins as well. That'll uh, break the hierarchy that uh, CAT looks to um, in, in the uh, cytochrome C, for example. We can really we can really dig deep in the mitochondria and look at the CO1 gene in the mitochondria, and that's really conserved. And we can look at barcoding and we can uh, figure out a way to determine what's related and, and what's not. But one really specific prediction, and I'm done, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, because he's he has papers on uh, the Y chromosome, and the mitochondrial DNA that takes us right back to two ancestors just thousands of years ago, mitochondrial Eve, Y chromosome Adam. So the evolutionists have a problem with that. So he said, okay, okay. He looked at African people groups, for example, the Khoisan peoples, and he said, I'll show you how accurate the mutation rate is, showing that Eve lived just thousands of years ago. I predict the mutation rate in these Khoisan peoples. And he said, he said, evolutionists can do the same thing. And they admitted, there's a four hour debate between him and an evolutionist he admitted that's a that's a tough thing to do but he made that direct prediction that only future observations can tell us if it's true or not so i challenge the evolutionists to go make those uh those same predictions and that's just a few of probably the hundreds i can go over so really good question wow. i appreciate it <laughs> yeah a great question great answer um one just came in as well with a five dollar super chat um from snake was right i believe probably Pliskin is what you're talking to about. Um, standing for truth again. How can you say synergistic epitasis stim did I say that right? Oh, yeah, Thank you. Episodes. I'm close. Sim simultaneous causes fitness decreases while also saying it isn't visible to selection. Uh, so good question. I've had many debates with Snake was right. I think he's in school for cell biology. I'd recommend going to watch oh, both. Yeah, he's he's yeah. he's um, he's fun to talk to. Lots of discussions. You can watch those. We've touched on all these points. Uh, synergistic epistasis is the artificially contrived mechanism that population geneticists are kind of looking to to solve the degeneration problem. But um, you know, to the extent that there is a substantial amount of syner synergistic epistasis happening, it actually makes the genetic situation worse because. Um, what it does is it'll amplify the deleterious effects of mutations and then eventually, you know, mother nature uh, selection will be able to, to see these mutations. But all it does is it leads to further extinction in, in certain populations. But overall, the bigger picture is these 100 new mutations per person per generation are um, accumulating and the majority of beneficial mutations are going to escape positive selection. The few rare beneficials, they may have a high impact. Natural selection can amplify the best beneficial mutations, sickle cell anemia, for example, melanoprotein mutate. Actually, a lot of these are shown to be epigenetic regulations now, actually. But uh, it's those vast majority of invisible mutations, the nearly neutral ones. Those are the ones that build up 
in our genetics and slowly degenerating it, degenerated us. And you've seen in my closing, I went over a few lines of evidence showing the degeneration process at work and showing that it has been at work in the, in the past. But I have a really extensive paper on synergistic epistasis written by somebody a lot smarter than I am, uh, Dr. John Sanford. So I'll post that in the um, comment section as well for everybody to see. Okay, so Tracted has a couple. Um, I'll just take the one I see right here. So Adam and Eve were created with pre-existing DNA differences, including different endogenous retroviruses. Good questions. Yeah. So as I was saying earlier, you know, these uh, DNA elements like the um, transposable elements, the um, endogenous retroviruses, because of their um, functional roles in, I mean, so much determining cell, uh, cell types, uh, their important roles in cell stress responses. Um, literally, many of these retrotransposons, and I can go on and on, I'm fascinated by this topic, but they have the, the start sequence for many different genes, especially genes in the brain. And these jumping genes can jump around the genome, turning on and off genes performing functional roles like we're just beginning to understand the uh, level of genetic um comp like multifunctional the, the genome is is nested and as, as far as i'm concerned regarding the NACO test the test done uh, based on mutagenesis we understand less than one percent of of the genome so yeah these ervs were created as uh, variation inducing genetic elements at the start of creation based on that uh, created genetic uh, heterozygosity hypothesis. That's why, obviously, even an evolutionist should be able to say, okay, if that's true, one way to determine if that hypothesis has any validity to it, we need to study the genetics and see if the vast majority of these created units are functional. So I think that's pretty straightforward. Good question. Thanks. Okay, last one. Standing for truth again from our friend Peter Quinn. How do you explain the Habsburg? Oh, um, you lost me there. Can you ask that question again? How do you pre uh, explain the Habsburg? The Habsburg? Is yeah. that have to do with like... I don't know. If you don't know, I don't know. Does anybody know? Not the claim. Uh, they might mean the Habsburg's dynasty. Um, they were inbred, I think. The Habsburg. I think that's maybe what they mean. I would say, I, I always point to inbreeding as a way uh, to show that the evolutionary out of Africa scenario is literally impossible. I mean, there's this near extinction event that reduces the population 70,000 years ago to two to 10,000. And for many, many generations, they inbred. Look at the cheetahs today. We got 6,000 that are going to go extinct because of inbreeding and genetic damage. So inbreeding, we would predict post Babel. That's how we explain all these so-called uh, pre-humans, Neanderthal, hobbits, uh, you know, uh, Heidelbergensis, around. Habsburg. I'm sorry. I, it's ha I'm sorry. Just to clarify, Habsburg royal family, and I think Cliff was right. Thank you, Cliff. Yeah, no problem. Is that in the? Uh, is that like uh, what is that? Is that Y chromosome? The are they looking at a specific? Um, I'm not I too guess sure. It was, uh, well, if it is I think in green. Yeah, if he wants to uh, be a little more thorough. Yeah, um, I'll send him, uh, you know what, he can send it to me, Peter, if you want to give me a more, you know, of a, you know, outlined question, I can send it on to him uh, in email, okay? So, um, yeah, or are you going to do this again next time? Uh, I want to be, I want to do this super chats, but I want to also thank you guys so much. This has been great. Um, before you know just in case anybody has to leave before i um finish um this has been wonderful and i and i thank you both there you go. it was a, I, I had fun talking to cats i want to thank him i've been looking forward to this one after watching his uh debate with hoven so i, I appreciate you doing it no I've, I've i've really enjoyed it it's been a lot uh uh, a lot better to speak to, to someone who at least understands a bit. <laughs> so, are, are you? Are you? Are you? Are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew you were going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you win this time, Marvel girl. <laughs> this one time. <laughs> I appreciate Kat's sense of humor. <laughs> He's great. Yeah. Did you Did you uh, hear the song, by the way? Uh, <gasps> yes. Of course. Can we play course. it on the outro, Ratch? Can you do that? Uh, I'll have to change. Uh, I, 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 uh, uh, making well, me do work and shit. <laughs> maybe before the outro. Before the outro. Just add it, maybe, somehow. Thank uh, you. 
Yeah, I, I, I can throw it in, uh, in the window. Hey, Mark, are we going to yes. read, read off the rest of the super yes, chat? Yes, we are reading off the super chat. So okay. I'm going to start with mistake not with 10 pounds. That's pounds, right? Yeah. Argyle, Ar Argyle says hello. Thank you. Hi, Argyle. Go ahead. Uh, Cliff, you're going to do the next one? Yeah. So, Crafty Kila for two euros. The cats wins. Debate over. And that's a, a raw <laughs> raffle emoji. Uh, now I'm gonna cry myself to sleep. Your chat's uh, just so mean. <laughs> uh, again, crafty with five euros. The genetics claim that every human stems from Adam and Eve makes as much sense as homeopathy does to medicine. Ooh. Hey, I mean, I gave a, a number of lines of evidence, including a uh, Y chromosome variation. Actually, mm -hmm. you should look into the three major haplogroups that uh, in mitochondrial DNA that take us right back to Noah's three daughters-in-law. I mean, genetics, like I said, rocks, fossils, geography, these things aren't passed on sperm and egg. They're indirect at the lines of evidence in determining ancestry. I believe in limited ancestry. Uh, Katz believes in a universal common ancestry. And in, in the genetics, we can trace it right back to uh, two ancestors, um, Y chromosome Adam and a, uh, a mitochondrial Eve. And the, these are based on empir the, the empirical method. We're not using phylogenetic evolutionary assumptions to come up with the dates. Well, and these are just the facts. I, it's well, fascinating. Um, I would follow that up though with um, another one from subtracted and i'd like both of you to ring in on this if you would how do you then um explain the population growth yeah that's a good question so from um, adam and eve to now actually that that's a really good question because well i actually touched on it but so there's something called the hat map project and it actually showed that the genome is young simply based on the um the chromosomes that we have in, in the genetic structure in our dna for example we have a lot of uh, large linkage groups still but every generation we know we experience rounds of recombination gene conversion so deep time evolution would uh, suggest that these should all be scrambled to randomness, but yet, uh, you know, these large linkage groups still exist. And there's people like Dr. Robert Carter and Dr. John Sanford that can trace these back to the original uh, sequences. So, you know, that's really um, fascinating work as well. And and the population growth, for example, this new paper on the Y chromosome that suggests uh, the Y chromosome based on high sequence uh, gene sequencing, um, for example, uh, actually only goes back based on mutations uh, 45 years, 4,500 years ago to Y chromosome, uh, no, so he's made predictions based on population growth in not only the uh, Y chromosome, but also the mitochondrial DNA, that if this is true, if our, if, if our human species only go back 6,000 years ago, we should be able to read the history of civilization off of our DNA. Uh, the, the, you know, the transatlantic slave trade, for example, or the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, um, you know, the Mongol conquest, for example. So um, some pr some of those predictions have actually come true. I can uh, put those papers as well. And that all has to do with population growth and the history of humanity. So m more fascinating work. Uh, Katz, you can go ahead. Uh, so, so what was the question about this, the growth in population? Yeah, um, um, how we can be sure that there's, there's, you know, well, we know that we have data saying, all right, at this point, we had this many people. So it can't, like, it can't be from Adam and Eve. I don't want to actually say anything, because I'm not well, a debate. It, yeah, the growth does go back to Adam and Eve. The closest I can, the closest I can come to, to that is we can use uh, mitochondrial DNA, and we can use the Y chromosome to trace the movement out of Africa. Um, mitochondrial DNA, because the mutation rate is so high, it becomes ideal that when we find uh, when we, we find early humans and we can test, you know, test the, the DNA, we can almost like put the, the mitochondrial DNA mutations next to each other like you would with fossils to go from from like the most similar to the least and we can trace a path and we can do similar things with the Y chromosome and we can show the paths that humans put to migrate as they come out of Africa but the interesting thing is and I had a paper on this uh, but we never got to it the interesting thing is when you actually trace the um uh, the, the um and, and you age them from the mutation rates expected for Y chromosomes and for mitochondrial DNA, it actually matches up really, really well with the archaeological record that you get as well. Um, I'm waffling now. No, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, so ne next one, uh, Cliff, it's your turn, I believe. Yeah. So Anthony Purcell with five Australian dollars, throwing some shade your way. He says, standing for truth failed to present any argument beyond a series of unsubstantiated assertions. 
He's coming at me. He's coming at me. Well, there he is. Like I said, there, there, there's a lot of reason for myself to cry uh, tonight to sleep. But you know what? Uh, just rewatch the opening. I did, and I'm glad that uh, Katz touched on the Y chromosome uh, variation and mitochondrial DNA as well. Uh, that's why I talked about, like, based on high sequence. Um, uh, genetics, for example, on the Y chromosome, it shows, and I talked about it in my opening as well, that the Y chromosome variation and the mutations in the Y chromosome uh, only go back about 4,500 years to uh, Y chromosome NOAA. And then the uh, mitochondrial DNA, simply based on the, the empirically observed mutation rate, um, studies show that mitochondrial Eve lived just recently, thousands of years ago. So the evolutionists, like um, Kat said, they have done similar uh, similar analyses, but rather, and he said it there with archaeology, it's fascinating, the, the evolutionists don't but and realize it rather than using the actually observed mutation rates they're compelled to use hypothetical mutation rates that are about 20 fold lower than what is actually observed mutation rates across the board in the mitochondrial dna are high and then they justify this just like cats did based on certain evolutionary assumptions assumptions on the geological column assumptions in uh, archaeology so we just use the empirical method and it takes our ancestors adam and eve just back uh, six thousand years ago for eve 4500 years ago for but isn't uh, that different from the biblical no, adam that's totally different right it would be based on um the worldviews but yeah the evolutionists will say that adam and eve only go back you know they go back two hundred thousand years ago for example uh, and they weren't the adam and eve of the bible but like i said based on the empirical method uh based on predictions on the history of humanity and the y chromosome and the mitochondrial dna they go back just thousands of years ago the out of africa theory has been destroyed uh, so may i ask if you're a young earth creationist Yes. Yeah. You are young Earth. Okay, that's yeah. interesting. I hope I made that clear in, in my opening. But yeah, yeah, good question. I just want to make sure, because um, people had asked. Uh, and great, thank you. I, I just have to, unfortunately, because I put my kids down for a nap, and I agreed with my wife that we do the debate oh, at four thirty. Absolutely. It I want you to, if you have super chats, of course, read them off real quick. Um, I will absolutely I'm do that real quick with answering. I, I'm sure you both are. Um, Real quick, let's go in from Anthony again for five Australian dollars, invoking an op, um, oh my God, I can't omnipotent. speak it. Omnipotent. Dude, I know the word, I was, I'm Catholic. Deity, you <laughs> You're can explain good. anything, but you can't make any predictions against which observations can be compared. Thank you, Anthony. I yeah, well, I'll just say one thing. It's funny because it's like the evolution. It's like it goes in one ear and out the other. I'm not saying that's with cats. I think he's understanding a lot of what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. We have a we have a Dr. Nathaniel Jensen. He literally pointed at African people groups where their where their um, measured uh, mutation rates in the mitochondrial DNA have not been measured. They're not known. And he literally pointed at them and said, this is what I predict based on genetic diversity in African people groups and, and, and non-African people groups and mutation rates in non-African people groups that we know. He made a prediction. It's literally on paper. This is how many times a generation they're going to mutate. Now, all they need to do is get some blood and some DNA from these people groups. And let's see if the prediction's true. Like that is a direct prediction. That's like me pointing at somebody on the street and saying, hey, you ever played baseball before? And they say, yeah, of course. I say, you're going to hit a ball this far. Like that is as precise and specific. Uh, I just don't like when the evolution is straw man and they misrepresent the model because whether you agree with it or not, there are predictions that have been made and I can show those. Thank you. Um, Cliff, go ahead. Okay, last one. So Anthony Purcell again for her five Australian dollars. No, not the last one. Harmful. No, last one. On yeah, here. No. harmful, harmful slash useless viral insertions are not selected for. They are selected against. So the fact the insertions we see are useful is exactly as predicted. Nothing. On the was that a secret? Yeah, I, I would say a lot of that was addressed in the discussion. I don't want to yeah. be redundant. Yeah. I would just say go rewatch the discussion, which I thoroughly enjoyed, mind you. It's great. Um, just quickly, the last few from Snark to be read at the end. Thank you. Um, from Robert, 499 for the AC Fund. Thank you, love. Good. Let's see. I don't know if you can see any of these cliff. That's why. But, I'm but you have through. snow now, Marvel. Why? Why, why do you need an AC? Uh, <laughs> in between, I live in Colorado, so we have hot days and then snow, and then hot days and then snow, and it's Colorado. Wait five minutes if you don't like the weather; it'll change. Craft tequila for two euros. Fantastic debate all around. I concur. Thank you guys again. I, pre I appreciate it. I I agree. I concur as well. It re reminds me of that. What was that movie with Leonardo DiCaprio? Um, he pretend to be a. No, no, that's a good one too. Um, I think because <laughs> I'm getting so burnt out for some reason, I can't. It's with Tom Hanks. Catch me if you can. 
Catch me if you can. Yeah. Catch he, me if you can. Oh, that's a wonderful movie. Yeah. He, he watches like some videos yes. on it. I concur. But then he passes out after. <laughs> yeah. Okay, John Rapp for I believe that's Australian. Five dollars. Oh, an AC fund. That sounds like a worthy thing. Good day, Marvel girl. You need to chill. Hmm, that's ironic. You're so cool. Aw, good day, everyone, too. He said hi, everybody. Um, let's see. Snake was right again. Standing for truth, Snake is saying, for $5. You didn't answer how epistasis can decrease fitness and still not be visible. Also, humans and chips have a lower CO1 difference than cats. Right, yeah. If we would have got into that, too, like, for example, God created two humans, Adam and Eve, so we predict low genetic diversity. Lo and behold, that's what we see. That's why the yeah. evolutionists in invented the out-of-Africa scenario to explain the low genetic homogeneity. Uh, God, according to the Bible, created populations of animals, so we'd expect a higher genetic diversity, of course. This is kind of just common sense. And synergistic epistasis, um, when it comes to the fitness, he needs to define fitness, because often fitness is defined in a narrow sense. The best definition of fitness should be total functionality. Yeah, Lenski experiment, for example, there were some increases in fitness in a narrow sense, but overall they're getting rid of genes short term and it's long term degeneration. So the total function, the total functionality has decreased. It all comes down to net gain versus net loss and the evolutionists have failed in uh, explaining the net gain versus the net loss because a lot of these genomes, they are shrinking. The Lenski bacteria, they've, they now have shrinking functional genome sizes. This is degeneration at work. So good question. Okay, great. Stringer News, $10, even though there's snow outside. AC Fun, see? He, he agrees, Raj. And um, that's <laughs> it. Thank you. Wow, we made it.